Who, me? Film three videos on the same day so that I don't have to film during the actual disaster that is moving flats? Never. Hello darlings and welcome back to my channel. My name is Robin Hahn, I am a queer and disabled opera singer, and this is the third video in a series about my disabilities and my life as a disabled opera singer. So here it is. The one that I was the most nervous to do. My actual diagnosis story. Well, before we start story time, if you were looking for a joyful little corner of the internet where we could discuss opera, disability, queerness, cats, and tea, you have found it. And if you weren't looking for it, you have found it anyway. So go hit that subscribe button and ring the little bell so you never miss a video. I don't exactly have a lot of followers, but the more that we normalize discussing disability, the better off we all are. So here goes nothing. I'm procrastinating now, I should get to it. My disorder is genetic, meaning that not only did I get it from my parents, specifically probably my mom, I've had it since birth. But I didn't get any negative symptoms until I was like 17 or 18. When I was a kid, I wouldn't really say that I had symptoms so much as I had signs. And if people had been looking for them or had even known what to look for, they might have been able to identify it, but probably not. <laughs> my mom just thought that they were cute quirks her baby had, I guess. So one of the first things that my mom noticed about me when I sprang into the world was that I had really, really long spindly fingers, even as a baby. Apparently it was one of the first things she commented on when she held me in the hospital. My hands are pretty small for my adult human body, but apparently I came out like E.T. <laughs> Still, even for small hands, the part of my hand that's finger is really, really long. When I was a toddler, one of my first memories is of my mum squishing and giggling at the small little white bumps that were on my heel. I know that she knew that they were odd, but you know, we giggled about them. No one ever thought that they meant anything. They were just little bumps on my heel. I also had growing pains even during times when I was not growing, or even past the time I stopped growing at age 11. Yes, I stopped growing at age 11. I am short as heck. <laughs> Plus, I could always do all of those party tricks that I have in the first video. I was always quite flexible, though no one ever thought anything of it. I was a ballet dancer starting from the age of four, and I did gymnastics as well, and therefore had actually been doing flexibility training from a young age. But even more than traditionally flexible, I was also extremely double-jointed, head to toe. But it never occurred to anyone that this might be a bad thing. The party tricks I could do with my joints were just that, party tricks, and nothing more. I had my first truly negative symptom when I was about, yeah, 17 or 18 as I'd said. And I remember it very vividly because it surprised me. I really love Perrier. I really love sparkling water. And I had a gigantic bottle of it on my nightstand. And without thinking about it, I reached over to go pick it up. And as I picked it up, as I grabbed it, a shot of pain just went through my arm like lightning and I dropped it. And I remember going, and then like looking at my hand as though it wasn't my own because I had never known it to do anything weird like that. And then I slowly went and grabbed it again because it hadn't shattered. I dropped it like from two inches above the table. So it's not like it had gone far. So I slowly picked it up again and it was fine. And I thought, huh, that was weird. Weird. I've never had unexplained pain before, you know? But I think the next thing that started happening was that I started getting pains in my legs and they felt like really, really deep, profound ache inside my bones. I called it bone pain and it would travel. That was the weird thing. I'd usually get it in my legs or feet and it would start to slowly move. It could start like this. So I would be walking down the street completely normally and then I'd start to get the bone pain and from one step to another, I'd start to limp. The same thing could happen the other way around. I could be limping and then suddenly stop. So when I was in my late teens, I, it was the first time I went to my GP asking her about weird body stuff. GPs are a thing we have in Canada called your general practitioner. This is your like own personal doctor. They've probably known you for a really long time and they're sort of your hub. I went to the GP and the doctor said, you must be anemic because you've been a vegetarian your whole life. <laughs> so yes, I've been a vegetarian my whole life. I have tasted most normal meats and I don't understand the appeal. Oh, I'm gonna get such hate in the comments for that. Anyway, wasn't anemic. Very much not so. And no further inquiries were made. My doctor didn't even do anything with that information. 
So that was the last I heard about it. A few years later, I started to get some of this traveling bone pain in my arms, and it was starting to snake its way occasionally up to my hips or shoulders. And when it hit my hips, I would stop being able to walk. Just my body would sort of nope out of walking and I'd sit where I was, whether that was on a friend's kitchen floor. I apparently do a lot of these things on friend's kitchen floors. Whatever. That friend urged me to go back to my GP. I go back to my GP and she says, you must be anemic because you've been a vegetarian your whole life. Was it anemic? Very much not so. And no further inquiries were made. So the symptoms began to pile up over the years. I start getting dizzy spells, digestive issues, and almost daily headaches, plus a strange shiver. But again, I've been told this is normal. By this point, I just start making jokes like, oh, my body isn't ill, it's weird. I just have a weird body. So I'm fine, right? Even at this point in my life, a lot of my friend's group were disabled or chronically ill. And I sort of had an identity within that group as the not ill one. Because anything that happened to my body was nothing like what happened to them, my body was fine. And therefore it was impossible for there to be anything wrong with me. <laughs> Eventually, by the time I was in my early 20s, as the symptoms were escalating, those very people in my life who were chronically ill and who I was comparing myself to to tell myself, see, I'm fine, were telling me, maybe not, maybe you should go back to a doctor. So I did. I went back to my GP and she said, you must be anemic because you've been a vegetarian your whole life. Wasn't anemic. Very much not so. No further inquiries were made. But this time, my doctor added this. Your symptoms are very nonspecific. They're very general and they don't point me in any particular direction. In the medical profession, we have a saying, when we hear hoofbeats, we think horses, not zebras. That'll come back later. It didn't occur to me at the time that saying horses not zebras sort of implies that zebras don't exist. Zebras aren't unicorns, they are zebras. They may be rarer, but they're real. So it should then be horses, then zebras, not not zebras. By the time I'm in my mid twenties, I'm experiencing pain, nausea, headaches and migraines, lightheadedness, digestive issues, etc., etc. every day. But I still think my body is just weird. And I go to Germany to sing opera and it was wonderful. It's exactly what I wanted. But living the operatic life in Germany is hard on the body. You spend a lot of time traveling and living out of a suitcase, dragging behind you everything that you own, including all your bell gowns and your massive score collection. There are lots of long haul bus rides and transfers in the cold for hours where there's no real shelter and a lot of moving too, a lot of the time. It's very difficult to settle when you're going from country to country or province to province, or city to city singing. Within a few months of me arriving in Germany, my symptoms were really bad. And even my non-chronically ill friend in Frankfurt, where I was staying at the time, kept telling me there is something wrong and you need to check it out. But because of the visa that I was in Germany on at the time, I was really only covered for the type of event that caused a broken leg, not for like, going to the doctor to see what was wrong with you. So I had no doctor and no way to get one or talk to one really. So I started actually doing a little bit of research. <laughs> I was looking at medical research papers and comparing symptom list or diagnostic criteria. But as my GP in Canada had said, my symptoms were pretty vague and systemic and not well connected. So I had a really long list of possibilities. The list of possibilities doesn't really scare me. I have always sort of imagined my body like I'm living in a science experiment. <laughs> Finding these things out only ever really fascinated me from a scientific <laughs> or even a problem solving perspective. But I didn't really get answers and eventually I sort of stopped. Then in December of the year that I went to Germany, my symptoms became a lot worse. The pain in my limbs got really severe. I remember at one point feeling like I wanted to curl up on the wet sidewalk outside rather than take another step to go home. My fatigue was worse than ever too and difficulty eating plus the normal sort of malaise and nausea and headaches. They were really strong. Some friends of mine suggested that I start staying home but me being me I just pushed through because hey my body is just weird and this is what it normally does. And then one day I got home from work and it was just the worst. Yeah, it was the worst I had ever felt at that point in terms of my normal symptoms. But none of my symptoms were new. These were all the same things I experienced on a normal basis, just worse. There was nothing really to differentiate it. 
so it never even occurred to me something was wrong, to be honest. I've been managing these exact same symptoms for years at this point, so I just assume I'm tired or maybe a little burnt out and need a break. Until, well, let's just say I was really lucky my apartment was small enough that I could reach the sink from the toilet. That's all I'll tell ya. When I was done expelling everything, I got up and was very, very lucky to make it to my bed before fainting. And then it hit me. Oh my gosh, I've had the flu this whole time. <laughs> I had no idea. I had the worst flu of my life because it was the same as my normal life. Yes, friends, this means I literally confused my normal everyday symptoms with those of a really severe flu. That was a wake up call and a half, let me tell ya. I had it for two months after that. Fevers, chills, the whole shebang. And I was not able to tell until it made itself clear it was the flu, which was weeks in. I went out like that. I went into crowded places like that. I sang and therefore expectorated on people like that. And I worked with children like that. In today's age of a global pandemic, the ramifications of this are clear. I could have gotten someone really, really sick. And I don't know, maybe I did. I have no clue. So as I start to recover, this time in bed, <laughs> I dive deeply into the medical lore because it's not an option for me to hurt people, even accidentally. So I dive really deeply into these medical documents, sorting and making the long list of possibilities slightly shorter, but I'm not a doctor and I don't know what any of those words mean. <laughs> Half the words in these documents I've never seen before in my life, I don't know how to pronounce, I don't even know where to begin to look them up. So I just store those things away. During this time, I discover that one of the conditions on my long list of possibilities has new diagnostic criteria, including a whole sheet that you can find on the internet and add little check marks to. But again, I don't know half the words on this sheet, so I kind of assume that the words that I don't know don't relate to me, because a doctor has never mentioned them to me. I keep it on my short list and I move on. So the next summer I come back to Canada for my first visit and I finally get to see my GP again, this time with a comprehensive list of all of my symptoms in chronological order. I have everything in detail and I can tell her way more about my experience. This time I get a different response. She says, yeah, I agree that sounds like something, but I don't know what it is and I don't have the time to look it up. And she told the zebra story again. So I go back to Germany, empty-handed. Once again, I'm on a visa with medical insurance that only covers hospital stays, not general doctor's visits. I don't have an option to get a second opinion from a German doctor here. So I go back to the medical literature. But this time I also start looking through some resources put together by and for the chronic illness community, just in case this offers me some extra insight. And then one afternoon, while I am doing the dishes in my kitchen, and I have my computer up on the counter to watch some YouTube videos while I'm cleaning, I come across a video that breaks down and explains every bit of medical ease in the new diagnostic criteria for the condition I had found months ago. And it finally explains what all of those words that I didn't understand meant. Arachnodactyly? Really long spindly fingers. Pisogenic papules of the heel. Funny little white bumps on your heel. Baton score. A test out of nine for how hypermobile you are. I scored nine. I remember very vividly standing in my kitchen with my hands still in the sink and realizing I had figured it out. I had hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There are many types of EDS and hypermobile type is the only type that is diagnosed with diagnostic criteria. All other types are diagnosed with genetic testing. And I was very lucky because I matched the list and the list was the way you got diagnosed, meaning that I knew right away. And my only job now was to convince a doctor of it. I needed the diagnosis, but you know, I was still in Germany, still on that same visa and still had no doctor. When I came back to Canada next, my body was <laughs> a total wreck. And instead of going to the same GP, my chronically ill and disabled community recommended a different GP to me, one who ran a walk-in practice. They knew him to be inquisitive, smart, interested, and supportive of patients, even when their illness was invisible to him. So I go in to meet him instead. And this time I go in with the diagnostic criteria all printed out and with check marks literally written in to the spots 
that I knew fit me. He had to Google stuff in my appointment. He Googled pyzogenic papules of the heel and said, yep, you definitely have those. He Googled the tests for arachnodactyly and said, yep, you can do them. He Googled the Baton score and ran it with me and all the other criteria. In the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos, there are several different categories and you need to check off a certain number of things per category. And I did, and he agreed with me. It was amazing. The first time a doctor had ever said, yep, yeah, you're totally right, this is a thing. You have something, for sure. He said, yes, I think you totally have HEDS. Let's send you to a rheumatologist. For those who don't know, a rheumatologist is a specialist dealing with rheumatic diseases meaning they tend to be the specialist you're sent to diagnose or treat joint issues such as arthritis, as well as autoimmune diseases and inherited connective tissue disorders, among other things. My GP alone couldn't officially diagnose me because EDS is not exactly his area of expertise. So rheumatology was my next step in pursuing a diagnosis and eventually treatment. Now, an error got made <laughs> in my referral, which is actually great for me because I got sent to two rheumatologists. My appointment with my first one is for the day after I returned to Canada from Helsinki, traveling opera singer life. It was literally the morning after, early in the morning, and I was very jet lagged and very sleepy and very groggy. And I had to go in alone. I go into my rheumatologist, he does the bait and test on me, and he says, yep, you're hypermobile, but why do you want this diagnosis? There's no cure and nothing I can do for you. Well. Excuse me. Look, I'm Canadian. Politeness is built into the very fabric of our society. Besides this, at this point in the story, I have absolutely zero spoons and my head is about 180% brain fog. My response to his question came out stumbling, halting, maybe a little teary out of exhaustion, and I mumbled something apologetic about being super jet lagged, but added that I needed people to know there was something wrong with me to be able to treat any ongoing or future complications or something. I knew that EDS needs active symptom management and monitoring from a medical team in the long term, and when I pointed that out, he said that I was depressed. A rheumatologist, who works on joints, who had known me for 20 minutes, said I was depressed. <laughs> Now, I don't really think I snapped at him. Even as brain foggy as I was, I knew that would be a bad way to get through to someone. <laughs> but I definitely sat up in my chair and like, evenly but firmly said, No, if you knew me, you would know that's not true. I'm just jet lagged, upset, and now I'm mad at you. So that didn't go well. Of course, there is no shame in having depression. It is a valid diagnosis with serious symptoms, and doctors should take patients with depression seriously and work with individuals to tailor their care in a way that's right for them. The fact was that in this appointment, from my perspective, two not okay things were happening. One, I felt he was trying to dismiss my concerns by insinuating they were quote unquote, just depression. And two, it seemed like he was implying a diagnosis for me that he was patently unqualified to make for the purpose of dismissing my case. Now, this by no means is going to work for every patient and for every doctor, but in my case, when I stood up for myself, I was lucky that his reaction was actually, and this is true, to say he was sorry for making that assumption. He looked, uh, pretty told off, to tell you the truth. I left. And I never spoke to him again. Luckily, my second rheumatologist was an angel, and she continues to be. So I was quite nervous when I walked in. For obvious reasons, the precedent had been set and the bar was low. But my first appointment was an hour long, detailing every part of my history. Top to bottom, she asked thorough questions that the first rheumatologist hadn't even mentioned. We essentially went through the whole story so far with a fine-toothed comb, analyzing each type of pain I get, every type of headache, what happens when I faint or feel nauseated, and more. It took ages, and I genuinely felt like she listened to me. I walked out of her office an hour and a half later with a formal diagnosis of HEDS plus referrals to other specialists to help manage my condition. It takes a very long time to get an EDS diagnosis, and most EDS patients will get the zebra story from someone at some point. In fact, the awareness color for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is zebra print. We call each other zebras. It's part of the identity. We take it and make it ours. So that's it. That's my long and twisty and winding journey to diagnosis. Now you know, it only took me like a decade. It's fine. 
If you are not diagnosed, you are seen and your concerns are valid. If you are diagnosed, please leave your zebra story in the comments along with any other resources to share. And thanks for sticking around for this little mini series of mine. It's been experimental and fun and challenging and I'm so glad I did it. The support I've been feeling from you has been wonderful, so I can't thank you enough. If you'd like to stick around, please do hit the subscribe button and ring the little bell. Keep the comment section full of joy and light, and I will see you in my next video. The gardeners are back. The gardeners are back. Oh my god. No. Or a city to sing. <laughs>